Terry Barber is a best-selling author and founder of Lighthouse Catholic Media. Jesse Romero is a retired law enforcement officer, a former kickboxing champion with a master's degree in theology. And together, they share a passion for evangelization and PhDs in common sense. You're listening to The Terry and Jesse Show on Immaculate Heart Radio. To join the show, call 888-526-2151. Here's Terry and Jesse. Straight talk, Catholicism. Sit back, pull up a chair, grab your favorite drink. We'll turn your frown upside down. We've been known to make bad boys good boys. Amen. Hey, soul food on the line. I know it's dinner time. Some better than dinner, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Today, Luke 19, 11, 28. You know, today's gospel has a clear moral teaching. You're going to see that Jesus Christ is going to stress the need for responsibility. And he expects his followers to fulfill their Christian duties even when he's gone. And guess what? This stuff about, uh, well, I was afraid to do the right thing. That's no excuse. And laziness, that's not an excuse either. For lack of productivity. Here's what it says. Quote, as they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem. And because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. What's happening right here? The disciples expected that when Jesus arrived at Jerusalem, that he was going to establish a messianic kingdom. And they thought he was going to conquer pagan Rome. And the apostles were going to hold these, these key positions in his kingdom. But Jesus, he corrected the misunderstanding with the parable. Jesus shows that he's going to have to be absent for a time before he returns to judge his enemies and settle account with his servants. Verse 12, he said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive a kingdom and then return. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten pounds and said to them, trade with these till I come. Well, what, 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 is, what is a pound? A pound was worth nearly four months' wages for labor. So that's a lot of money, verse 14. But his citizens hated him and sent an embassy after him, saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. Wow. This breaks my heart when I hear people say, We don't want Jesus to reign over us. You know what our response should be? The words of St. Paul, 1 Corinthians 15, 25. He must reign, verse 15. When he returned, having received the kingdom... He commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know what they had gained by trading. The first came before him saying, Lord, your pound has made 10 pounds more. And he said to him, well done, good servant, because you have been faithful in a very little. You shall have authority over 10 cities. Notice here, God looks at your fidelity in little things and the greater our effort in, in, in these little things, God's going to reward us with bigger things. Verse 18. And the second came saying, Lord, your pound has made five pounds. And he said to him, and you are and you are to be over five cities. Then another came saying, Lord, here's your pound, which I kept laid away in a napkin. For I was afraid of you because you're a severe man. You take up what you did not lay down and reap what you did not sow. He said to him, I will condemn you out of your own mouth, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man taking up what I did not lay down and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the into the bank, and at my coming, I should have collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood by, take the pound from him and give it to him who has ten pounds. And they said to him, Lord, he has ten pounds. I tell you that to everyone who has will, who has will be more given, but from him who has not, even what he has will be taken away. But as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slave them before me. Notice he didn't say, hey, put them on probation or make them uh, pick up, uh, you know, trash uh, along the freeway. <laughs> hey, instant death penalty. Oh, I digress. Verse 28. And when he had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. The, uh, the, the gospel of the Lord. My only comment is this. Jesus' goal is to get to Jerusalem where he's going to make his triumphal em entry in preparation for his passion and death on Calvary. And the uh. fundamental storyline in Luke's gospel is this. We Human beings have free will. We have to make a choice. we got to accept God in Christ and what he tells us, or we're going to reject him and pay the price. My only comment is through this parable, our Lord teaches us that although his reign has begun, 
it will only be fully manifested later on. So in the time left to us, we should use all the resources and the graces God gives us in order to merit that reward. That's what Relevant Radio is using right now. All of our resources to proclaim the teachings of Christ through being an active radioactive Catholic. So this this parable is very powerful for all of us to think about, meditate, and implement. Also, this parable points to two things. It points to the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. That's right. When the city of Jerusalem, they drew a divine curse upon themselves for rejecting Jesus Christ as their messianic king. But it also it's, it's eschatological. It also talks about the end word. of time. Yeah, hey, time. Okay. S- smartest guy in the room, Venerable Fulton Sheen. What does he say today? Today he talks about the difference between liking, philia, and loving, agape, two Greek words. He says this, the Greeks had a second word for love, which was philia. This is the love we have for humanity. It was to be irrespective of any class, race, color, or any other distinction. Philia was not just a liking, it was a loving. Now there's a difference between the two, philia and agape liking is in the emotions in the feelings loving is in the will oh that's so powerful powerful because that's Tate yep. thomas because liking is in the emotions the emotions can change grow dull but loving is in the will and is therefore subject to command hence our lord said a new command i give to you a commandment love one another as i have loved you this is the difference between the two you know, you're seeing all kinds of people uh, in Hollywood, movie producers, news anchors, politicians. Uh, they're falling. They're falling as a result of there's a difference because they don't understand love. They understand what like is. Oh, I like that girl. I want to take her right now. I like that girl. I want to take her right now. But love is an act of the will. Love is what you should have for your spouse that you've covenanted yourself to. And as a result of that, uh we're seeing right now this explosion of people uh, falling from high places. I remember Bishop Shane Sheen saying this, if one loves, everything is easy. If one doesn't, everything is hard. I want to mention something. On our relevant radio website, seven helpful hints for a happy Thanksgiving. Yeah, we're going to be having a happy Thanksgiving tomorrow. We're going to talk about that. Start the day with Mass. Look up the time of your parish with, has Mass on Thanksgiving. Do you know what the word Eucharist means? Thanksgiving. So why not go to Mass and, you know, offer that Mass for all of your relatives and friends that you are going to be visiting with for Thanksgiving Day. Also, another one, prepare ahead of time. Don't wait until the last minute to get things you need to get done. Try and prepare ahead of time, right? That's a good policy. Except that you... Don't want to be able to control everything. You know what? Control freaks, right? You know, I got to have everything. There's going to be things you can't control tomorrow, right? Get over it. Here's a good one. Make the blessing a highlight of the day. Yeah, at Thanksgiving, your meal, really make it a highlight. Now, here's my suggestion. Dad, listen up. Take 30 seconds. Let everybody quiet down and bring attention to the grace and giving thanks. I do this at our home. I ask everybody individually, what do you want to thank Jesus for? And everybody has a, we have 36 people in our our Thanksgiving dinner tomorrow. Everybody's going to be thanking God for something. Here's another one. Start being grateful right now. You know, the attitude of gratitude, it's welcome just about everywhere. And I mean everywhere. And again, let go of the fear of failure. So many times I've been talking to people today. I'm so stressed about the dinner tomorrow. Hey. You know what? You do your best. That's all. And let God do the rest. Take an opportunity to reach out to people. You know what I'm going to suggest you do? Bring some CDs. Bring some books, some pamphlets in your car. So when someone says something to you, you're prepared to evangelize them because you're prepared with good Catholic literature. And one more thing. Maybe you're sitting across some people that you might not like because every year they say the same thing to you. And you know what I do when they say that? I chuckle to myself. I say, well, at least they're consistent. So you got to have an attitude of gratitude. Jesse, before we break, I just want to ask you for the Romero family, what things do you do to have an attitude of gratitude? Well, like you just said, you start off the day with uh, 
Holy Mass. Yeah. Because for us as Catholics, the Eucharist is the ultimate Thanksgiving. I mean, literally, that's what the word Eucharist means. Yep. Thanksgiving. Yep. And also, morning offering, grace before meals. And mm. during during dinner time, what I always try to do is I gather the family around whoever comes around the table. I try to tell them about the actual story of Thanksgiving, the Christian roots, because so many people. In fact, that's what we're going to be talking about on the fourth segment. Yep. You're, you don't. Most people think, and I get it because you know I was taught that also in in secular history. Most people think that Thanksgiving was started by the Puritans, the nope. Plymouth Brethren Puritans, uh, over in Massachusetts. Well, you're going to learn something in the last segment that Thanksgiving was actually started by Catholics. Yep. What? 56 <laughs> years before the Puritan pilgrims of Massachusetts, the Catholics practiced and celebrated the first Thanksgiving in St. Augustine, Florida in 1565. So you're going to learn about the six interesting Catholic Thanksgiving facts that you need to know in the last segment. That's awesome. Well, up next, we're going to have Fulton Sheen laying out the 12 tricks the Antichrist will use to destroy Christians. You won't want to miss it on the Terry and Jesse Show. Relevant Radio. Christ has died. Check. Christ has risen. Check. Christ will come again. Are you ready? Hey, we're going to bring you the smartest guy in the room. Have you ever heard what Venerable Fulton Sheen says about the Antichrist? About 70 years ago, in 1947, he laid out 12 tricks that the Antichrist will use to destroy Christians. You know, it's been said that the greatest trick the devil ever tried to pull was convince man that he doesn't exist. Well, in a similar vein, Fulton, Venerable Sheen says, the greatest trick the Antichrist will pull will be to convince men that he's the savior of the world instead of its destroyer. And uh, and like the devil, whose trademark signature is to twist the truth to sell sin, so the Antichrist, according to Venerable Sheen, he's also going to twist the minds of men to make them believe that he's a great humanitarian who will talk peace, prosperity, and plenty. This description, these 12 bullets we're going to give you, about the Antichrist was given almost 70 years ago. Now, don't expect the Antichrist to be wearing red tights or vomit sulfur or carry a spear <laughs> or, or, or wave an arrowed tail, okay? Yeah. Uh, w w that, that's uh, th that's uh, Germanic literature. We're going to give you the facts according to Fulton Sheen, so let's prepare ourselves. Terry? And don't think he's a buffoon. Don't think like Flip Wilson saying on the... The devil made me do it. No, the devil's real. And Fulton Sheen, if you want to see this, go to our our web, our page, the Terry and Jesse Show at RelevantRadio.com because you can actually watch Bishop Sheen on YouTube talk about this. It's just powerful. But the first sign of the Antichrist, Archbishop Sheen says, and I'll just say it this way, full Sheen ahead. Here it comes, everybody. Bishop Sheen says he will come disguised as a great humanitarian. He will talk peace prosperity and plenty, not as means to lead us to God, but as a ends in the in themselves. What? Did they, are you kidding me, Archbishop Sheen? We've had people like that. Yeah. Boy. You know what? I, that that segues with paragraph. Prophetic. That, what Terry just read right there, if you read uh, paragraph 675 of the catechism, it basically, they call, uh, they're congruent. Because 675 of the Catechism says that that the Antichrist is going to try to form this political form of a secular messianism. Okay. Second thing that we know about the Antichrist, according to Venerable Sheen, he will write books on the new idea of God to suit the way people live. So he's going to redefine God. Terry? Number three, it's in your newspaper. He's going to introduce faith in astrology so you so as to make you not... The will, huh? but the stars responsible for our sins. You remember Bishop Sheen said that. And you know what he said also about sin? That there's going to be a denial of that there is sin. And that everybody thinks that they're immaculately conceived. Fulton Sheen, you said that 70 years ago? I'm 60. I've experienced that. He's prophetic again. Yeah, I think, I think what it said right there was 
so as to make not the will, but yeah, the stars the will, responsible for right. sins. Yeah. Yeah. Give me a break. Number, number four. He will explain guilt away psychologically as repressed sex, make men shrink in shame if their fellow men say they are not broad-minded and liberal. Guess what? That's happening in our, in our society right now. That's the... That's the zeitgeist that we're living under right now. The word zeitgeist, it's a German word. No, I'm not German. I'm Mexican-American. Zeitgeist means spirit of this age. Right now, we try to explain everything away through psychology. People are probably going to say, oh, Harvey Weinstein and all these other molesters, they did what they did because their sexuality is repressed. Watch. They're all going to run a psychiatrist. They're all going to run to these rehab places. And then it says here, Venerable Sheen says that, before the Antichrist comes, men make he'll make men shrink in shame if their fellow men say they're not broad-minded and liberal. Guess what? That's in place right now. Right now, go to a college. Go to some public venue and try to talk about something from the Bible or something about the Catholic faith. And watch people shout you down as a bigot saying you're not broad-minded and you're not liberal enough. Bishop Sheen, you're alive and well. Wow. Number five, he will identify tolerance with indifference to right and wrong. You know what he said? Moral principles do not depend on a majority vote. Bishop Sheen said wrong is wrong, even if everybody is wrong. And right is right, even if nobody is right. Objective truth has gone out the door in our culture. So here again, he's nailing it. Well, if he said that 70 years ago, what Terry just read is firmly in place right now. <laughs> Next bullet. Sad. The Antichrist will foster more divorces under the guise that another partner is vital. Wow. What? We're living Say right now. Again. Is this microphone on? The Antichrist will foster yes. more divorces under the guise that another partner is vital. Can I, can I, can, have you ever heard of the thing called um, no fall divorce? Or how about yeah, homosexual said. marriage? Or how about today, you know, uh, redefining marriage? Which basically means, hey, as long as you love somebody, uh, that's all that matters. You could love another man and you know, love the same sex. But more than anything, same uh, w this no-fault divorce in 1971 when it was passed in California, then it spread throughout the country like wildfire, that is congruent with what Fulton Sheen there said 70 years ago. Yep, this one's right here. He will increase love for love and decrease love for persons. Have you ever heard of the free love movement? There's no free love. Love is in the will, as Bishop Sheen says it. And again, think about what we're dealing with right now and see if Bishop Sheen is spot on. He will increase love for love and decrease love for persons. That's how mixed up we are today in 2017. Every time we use the pronoun he in these 12 bullets, we're talking about the Antichrist. So I'm yeah. just going to say Antichrist so you don't forget because That's if we say point. he, you're not going to know who we're talking about. Yeah. The Antichrist will invoke religion to destroy religion. Hmm. Oh, to invoke religion to destroy religion. Guess, I'll tell you two ways he's doing that. And we can see it right now if, if this is the time of the Antichrist. How is he invoking religion to destroy religion? He's using Islam, a radical form of it, and he's using a religion to destroy other religions. Radical Islam. Here's another way that the Antichrist will use religion to destroy religion. He's using progressive, liberal, dissenting Catholics to destroy our church from within. That's my take. Well, that's a powerful take. Okay, the Antichrist, he will even speak of Christ and say that he was the greatest man who ever lived. Interesting. I'll let you think about that one. That's happening today. The Antichrist mission, he will say will be to liberate men from the servitudes of superstition and fascism, which he will never define. Next, Terry. Well, the Antichrist in the midst, we'll say this, in the midst of all his seemingly love for humanity and his glib talk of freedom and equality, he will have one great secret, which he will tell to no one. He will not believe in God. And because his religion will be brotherhood without the fatherhood of God, he will deceive even the elect. What? 
that's a description right there of masonry, by the way. That last sentence that Terry just read. That's yes. an, that's a precise description of masonry. What, and that what could is Freemasonry? Yeah, we got to tell it, them what it, that is. It's a secret society that was yep. uh, started in the 18th century over in Great Britain by Masons, Protestant Masons. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and one of the things we know about Masonry is that in their charters and in their secret, and uh, in their, in their basically secret society, uh, the church has made uh, 150 years of pronouncements or denouncements against Masonry. Why? Because they've been set up to destroy the Catholic Church, amongst other things. Here's the last thing. Uh, Before you do that, let me just add. Let me add one more thing on that Freemasonry. Many people don't understand that you can't be a Freemason and a Catholic. The Catholic Church has taught that. Cardinal Ratzinger, through the Congregation of the Doctrine of Faith, 20 years ago, made that clear when the question came up. So, just by the way, just for your good to know file, you can't be a Mason and a practicing Catholic. It doesn't mix. Go ahead. Here's the 12th. The 12th bullet put out by Venerable Sheen on the Antichrist. He says, the Antichrist will set up a counter church. That's very interesting. A counter church, mm -hmm. which will be the ape of the church because he, the devil, is the ape of God. The, it will be the mystical body of the Antichrist that will in all externals resemble the church as the mystical body of Christ. That's scary. That's my comment. Uh, go, continue. In desperate need for God, the Antichrist will induce modern man in his loneliness and frustration to hunger more and more for membership in his community that will give man enlargement that will give man enlargement of purpose without any need of personal amendment and without the admission of personal guilt these are the days in which the devil has been given a particularly long rope what a, what's this counter church here's what i could I, i'm just thinking off the top of my head you I have an something. alternate you have an alternate yep. magisterium here even in this country you have uh, many catholic colleges and universities They've set themselves up as an alternate magisterium, saying, you know what? Listen to us. You don't have to listen to the, what the magisterium of the church teaches. And that was started, by the way, at the Lambeth Conference when the Catholic theologians and presidents of colleges opposed Pope Paul VI's encyclical Humanae Vitae. That's the counter church that I see in America right now. Not only in America, think about China, the patriotic church. Wow. You know, the only thing I can say good about the devil is he does his job well. When we come back, we'll continue to talk about what Fulton Sheen said, the 12 tricks the Antichrist will use to destroy Christians on the Terry and Jesse Show. For today's giveaway, call 877-526-2151. Catholic and proud of it. It's the Terry and Jesse Show on Relevant Radio. We are your spiritual fitness trainers. This is full contact Catholicism in the Lord's Gym with that Rocky music in the background. Remember, pain is temporary and the victory Amen. of heaven is forever. Don't be afraid, Catholics. Turn your back on sin and Satan. Exercise with us every day. Walk with the Lord. So who is the Antichrist? If you want to read who the Antichrist is, he's mentioned in St. John's epistles. The word Antichrist, it's a Greek word, which means one resembling Christ in appearance and power. He's mentioned in in 1 John chapter 2. You can read it. He's mentioned uh, about six times there. And in 1 John chapter 4, he's mentioned once. So if you want to do some homework tonight, and read where the Antichrist is found in the Bible. First John chapter 2. Read the whole chapter 2. He's mentioned there about five or six times. First John chapter 4. He's mentioned once. That's the only place he's mentioned in the entire Bible. St. Paul alludes to him but doesn't call him the Antichrist. He, uh, he calls him the man of sin. So there's three stages for the Antichrist according to the Catholic teaching. St. Paul basically gives us these three stages along with St. John the Apostles. First, you're going to have the evolution of evil. You're going to have a, a, a lot of evil before the second coming of Christ, number one. You're going to have a great apostasy. That's a lot of people turning away from the, from the faith, number two. And then you're going to have the Antichrist, the man of sin. So those are, those are the three stages according to Catholic tradition. The evolution of sin is going to increase, number one. 
There will be a great apostasy. Many Catholics will fall away from the faith, number two. And then you'll have the appearance of the Antichrist, the man of sin. Now, the according to Catholic teaching, the Antichrist is going to be an individual person. He's going to be a signal enemy of Jesus Christ. And this excludes the contention of those who explain the Antichrist either as the, as the whole collection of those who oppose Jesus. Now, we get it. There's been other Antichrist, in other words, with a small a throughout history. The Catholic, St. John the Apostle tells us that there's been many Antichrists. That's with a small a. But Catholic tradition tells us that the Antichrist with a capital A will be an individual person. Now, this individual person of the Antichrist, he's not going to be a demon, as some of the ancient writers believe, nor will he be a person, nor, nor, will he, nor will he be the person of the devil incarnate. Nope. He's going to be a human being, a human nature. He'll be the Antichrist. And uh, there's a lot of fathers of the church that believe perhaps he may be of Jewish extraction. Now, the Protestants have their own theory. We've heard that for years. The Protestants, you know, they have this... Uh, some the, the papal. Yeah. The, yeah, well, yeah, some Protestants. The, uh, let me... Let me uh, reframe that. The reformers, okay, the uh, actual reformers, go. Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, yeah. they had what's called the papal antichrist theory, and they had this, they had to come up with this theory. You know why? They had to oppose the, 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 the Catholic Church because if they didn't oppose the Catholic Church with popular and cogent arguments for their people, then they would have to submit to the church's divine authority. So they had to come up with this papal antichrist theory, which has basically fallen by the wayside. Now, the fathers of the church, here's some of the things that the, the church fathers have said about the antichrist, that he's going to rebuild the Jewish temple, okay? And they believe that uh, the Jewish temple in Jerusalem, by the way, and the early fathers also identified the Antichrist as a government official. Maybe a king who's going to come to power in the rooms of the Roman Empire. And again, the fathers of the church agree that he'll probably be Jewish, possibly from the tribe of Dan. And most importantly, they claim that Jesus, the Antichrist, the Antichrist is going to claim that Jesus was not the Christ, but that he is instead the Christ. That's what the Antichrist is going to claim according to the fathers of the church. The fathers say that the Antichrist is going to seduce many Jewish people by attempting to fulfill the political aspirations that they held for the Messiah. We also know that the Antichrist is going to be the deceiver of the world. He's going to pretend to be the Son of God. The Antichrist is going to pervert the sayings of our Lord Jesus Christ for his own desires. And he's going to say that there's neither a resurrection nor a judgment. Uh, and we also know that St. Irenaeus, he also says about the Antichrist that he's going to be an apostate. Apostate, that means he may be Catholic, a Catholic who's an apostate. And he's going to be, uh, he's going to be anxious to be adored as God, and that although he's a mere slave, he's going to wish to be proclaimed as the king. And the Antichrist is going to be imbued with the power of the devil, and uh, he's going to be an impious, an unjust, a lawless individual that's going to set himself aside so that men can worship him as God. Irenaeus says that the, the Antichrist will also sit as an enemy in the temple of Jerusalem, endeavoring to show himself as the Christ. So uh, those are a few things that the fathers of the church say about the Antichrist. And I'll, t I'll, I'll just uh, toss it over to Terry. Absolutely. Now let's talk about solutions, right? Everybody's going, wow, this is scary. Well, you know, if you live in the presence of God as your key, you can handle anything. So what must Catholics do to survive in these days? Well... I'll tell you what, it's holiness. Yeah, universal call to holiness. That's what the Second Vatican Council called us all. So Catholics ought to stir up their faith. You know what I want to suggest you do? Have a crucifix. I got a big one in the studio. I got them in my house, my kitchen, every room I have a crucifix, okay? Hang that crucifix in your home, and it reminds you that Jesus Christ died on the cross, and he is my hope, okay? That's what they have there. Now, gather the family, Dad, every night. For the rosary, mom and dad, get the kids down and pray that rosary every single day for world peace. This is what Our Lady of Fatima told us to do. And at the time you pray your rosary, I'm going to give this right now. Start it. We did it with my kids when they were young. We'd ask the kids to thank Jesus for specific things for that day. And then...
we would do an examination of conscience. Yes. And that way we'd all say the act of contrition together and asking for forgiveness. You do this every day, right? It will help you stay close to Jesus. Another thing, if, you, if your duties in your state and life allow you to do, go to Mass every day. I tell everybody, I've said this before, especially when I'm 61 years old. I started going to daily Mass when I was 14 because I realized what the Mass was all about. And I make it reparation. I have a specific intention every time I go to Mass. I got to go to two Masses today. You know why? I got to pray for special intentions today. Yes. Now, there's another thing I'm going to encourage you to do. Live in the state of grace. You know, at the end of the show, we always talk what state you should live in. Live in the state of grace because you know what? Just like Father Zachariah Boutro said, he was the Coptic priest who was who was basically told, you know what, you're going to die like your brother priest if you get in my way from these Muslim terrorists. He said, you can't send me anywhere that God isn't. When we're in love with Jesus Christ and we're living in the presence of God, Nothing can scare us because Jesus is with us. And don't forget the prayer to St. Michael and ask our lady and your guardian angel to be with you. Because if without that, you're going to lose the fight. I tell people the unemployment rate for guardian angels is way too high. Put them to work. Here's one more father of the church that I forgot to mention. And this Good. this Ellen. church father is a little bit scary because... He actually gives us the time when the Antichrist would be here. This is written by St. Nihilus in 430 A.D. He's an Eastern <laughs> father, St. Nihilus, 430 <laughs> yeah. A.D. Look at what he said about the Antichrist. He says this, quote, he said this a long time ago. He says, quote, after the year 1900, towards the middle of the 20th century, the people of that time will become unrecognizable. When the time for the advent of the Antichrist approaches. So stop there. This father says the Antichrist will be in the middle of the 20th century. He says it. He, he, and he goes on to say, people's minds will grow cloudy from carnal passions and dishonor and lawlessness will grow stronger. Then the world will, be, will become unrecognizable. People's appearances will change and it will be impossible to distinguish men from women due to their shamelessness <laughs> in dress and style of hair. Have you heard of transgender? Are you me? He says these people will be cruel and will be like wild animals because of the temptations of the Antichrist. There will be no respect for parents or elders. Love will disappear and Christian pastors, bishops and priests will become vain men, completely failing to distinguish the right hand away from the left hand. At that time, the morals and traditions of, of Christians and the church will change. People will abandon modesty and dissipation will reign. Falsehood and greed will attain great proportions. And woe to those who pile up treasures, lust, adultery, homosexuality, secret deeds, and murder will rule that society. Yikes! St. Uh, Nihilus. Unbelievable. Wow. For us. Wow, that's so powerful. That was the 4th century. Just remember what St. Augustine said. If you pray well, you will live well. If you live well, you will die well. And if you die well... All will be well. When we come back, you're going to be listening up up next. Six interesting Catholic Thanksgiving facts you need to know when you're at the dinner table tomorrow here at the Terry and Jesse Show. My name is Jesse Romero. I'm the Latin lover of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the Latin lover of Our Lady. And I'm Terry Barber, the Lebanese lover of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the Lebanese lover of Our Lady. I just want to mention in the last segment, there's a book that came out by uh, a couple of Protestant uh, Christian brothers, and it's the, the book is called The Islamic Antichrist. And basically, these authors from the Protestant worldview or point of view, they argue that the Antichrist will come from Islam. That's the last I'll say on that topic. It's called The Islamic Antichrist. You can take a look at it on the Internet. Did you know that Thanksgiving was started by Catholics. We're going to give you six interesting Catholic Thanksgiving facts that you need to put on your need-to-know file. And now, I know that the history books tell you that the first Thanksgiving was celebrated by the Protestant pilgrims of Massachusetts in 1621, but that's not entirely accurate. There was a Catholic Thanksgiving in 1565 in Florida, and another Catholic Thanksgiving in 1589 in Texas. 
here's what happened. The first Thanksgiving or the first American Thanksgiving was actually celebrated on September 8th, which is the feast of the, of the birth of the Blessed Virgin Mary, in 1565 in St. Augustine, Florida. The Native Americans and the Spanish settlers, they held the feast and the Holy Mass was offered. Guess what? This was 56 years before the Puritan pilgrims of Massachusetts came to celebrate Thanksgiving. Don Pedro Menendez came ashore amid the sounding of trumpets, artillery salutes, and the firing of cannons to claim the land for King Philip II in Spain. And the ship's chaplain, Father Francisco Lopez, he chanted the thanks be to God uh, prayer and presented a crucifix that uh, Don Pedro Menendez ceremoniously kissed. Then the 500 soldiers, the 500 Catholic soldiers, 200 Catholic sailors, and 100 families and artisans, along with the native Indians here, celebrated the holy sacrifice of the Mass in gratitude to God. That was the first Thanksgiving. And the second American Thanksgiving happened on April 30th, 1598, when the Spanish explorer Don Juan de Onate requested the friars to say a Mass of Thanksgiving, after which he formally proclaimed the La Toma, claiming the North Land of the Rio Grande for the King of Spain. Man, I wish I was at this meal. Listen to what they ate. The men feasted on duck, goose, and fish from the river. The actors among them dressed and, pr and presented a play. All this took place 23 years before the pilgrims set sail from England on the Mayflower. And here's the third bullet. The Protestant Puritan pilgrims, in case you didn't know, they were violently anti-Catholic. They left England because they thought that the Church of England was too Catholic. Get that. And these Protestant Puritans, they were strict Calvinists. You know, the ones that believe in double predestination, that God sends certain people to heaven and certain people to hell, and free will notwithstanding. These Protestant Puritan pilgrims, they also opposed celebrating Christmas. Did you know that? They also opposed dancing, musical instruments in church, and even they even opposed church hymns that were Catholic. They called them papistical. Wow, here's one that's going to blow you away. Squatanto, the beloved hero Squ of Squanto, Thanksgiving. Squanto. Squanto, the beloved hero of Thanksgiving at Plymouth Rock, was a Catholic. Squanto had been enslaved by the English, but he was freed by the Spanish Franciscans. Squanto thus received baptism and became a Catholic. And here's this. Check this out. So it was a baptized Catholic Native American who orchestrated what became known as Thanksgiving. Put that in your good to know file. Yes, yeah, Squanto is the famous Indian of, uh, of, of, Disney, of Disneyland fame. That's right. Uh, here's the fifth bullet that you, that you probably didn't know about Thanksgiving. So while Thanksgiving may celebrate the Calvinist separatists who fled England, Catholics might remember the same unjust laws that, that granted the crown of martyrdom to St. Thomas More, St. John Fisher, St. Edmund Campion, St. Margaret Clitheroe, and many others. In other words, the Catholics under the, under the crown of England were suffering from the same injustices that led the Protestant pilgrims to Plymouth, Massachusetts as well. And let's everybody remember that Thanksgiving is a Greek word for Eucharistica. Thus, the body and blood of Christ is the true Thanksgiving meal. That's why I say we should all go to Mass have to start our Thanksgiving day. I want to also have a little time to mention that after Thanksgiving, the Sunday that we celebrate coming up is Christ the King. Now, Christ the King's feast days was started in 1925, so it's pretty recent. And if you think about what was going on, think about what just happened in the world in 1917. Communism, right, was, was blossoming. So what did the Holy Father do? We're going to talk about Christ the King because Jesus is king of all the planet, every square mile of every place on the earth. And I want to mention that because there's so much devotion to the sacred heart that's tied into Christ the King. We see it. Can you see it in, in an image? Do you have a little picture in your home of Christ crowned as king? I do. And I think of it often 
And I'm going to mention this, that many of us who are listening have Hispanic backgrounds, okay? And there's a gentleman who was a Jesuit priest. And, Jesse, I'm going to let you tell the story on how he said it even in Spanish. This particular priest died, a martyr of the church, in, like, 1927. Can you tell us about what was going on in Mexico and how devotion to Christ the King was so important for those po- folks. And that was just recently promulgated in 1925. Blessed Miguel Pro, a Catholic yep. priest. Good. Yep. Uh, and uh, uh, 50,000 other Catholics, lay Catholics, many priests Amazing as well, story. they were killed by the Mexican government under Presidente Plutarco Calles, who was a communist slash socialist slash atheist. And basically... He wanted to stamp out Catholicism in Mexico. He attempted to do so between 1926 and 1929. He initiated a war against the church, wherein he killed, again, 50,000 Catholics, many of them priests that were counted amongst the dead. And he also closed down all the Catholic churches. It was known by Father Miguel Pro, other priests and other lay Catholics, that as they were being hung, as they were being shot in a firing squad, or as they were being killed killed by another form, they would all yell at the top of their lungs, basically this encyclical that was written by Pope Pius XI. It was just, it was just written. And the year before the Mexican government, it, the, the encyclical was written in 1925, and the Mexican That's government started attacking the church in 1926. So it was fresh in the mouth or in the hearts of Catholics Christ the King. So in Spanish, before they would die, they would yell, Viva Cristo Rey. And uh, and to me, that brings chills down my spine because, again, many of my family members have fled Mexico. My great-grandparents on both sides fled Mexico to the United States and brought their kids, my parents and my wife's parents, as a result of the persecution against the Catholic Church by the Mexican government. And family members of mine, many of them died out there in Morelia, Michoacan, uh, you know, uh, and these other places uh, were uh, uh, Sawayo, Michoacan, these other places where the, the uh, attacks were initiated. I mention this because Christ the King's feast day is this Sunday. I'm going to give you one more inspirational story before we have to run. And God bless you for that. But Cardinal Joseph Menzenti died in 1975, but he was a persecuted cardinal in Hungary. And the, well, it was the communists that were persecuting in 1956, the Hungarian uprise. Here's what they did to him. They starved him to death, right? They were making him eat very little food, and they were trying to get him to compromise his Catholic faith. So on Fridays, they would bring him a big filet mignon steak, right? And say, come on, eat, you're starving. And he wouldn't do it, because you know what they wanted to do? They wanted him to compromise his faith so he could tell everybody in Hungary, look at your cardinal. He's given up on his faith. What's the message to you and me? We're living in a country right now. We get to go to church tomorrow without any persecution. I want to give you this message. Go ahead, Jesse. Go ahead. You yeah. got it. Uh, you know where again, I'm going. I, what, what, yeah. what a blessing for us that we can yeah. go to church tomorrow and the government's That's not right. closing down our churches. We can receive Jesus tomorrow in Thanksgiving and the Eucharist, and yep. we're not going to get arrested Un- by the federal- federales. What a blessing. Yep. Unlike, unlike other places in the world. So, Jesse, what state should we be living in today? Definitely not the state of mortal sin. You don't even want to spend a weekend there. Don't even park your car there for an hour. You want to live in the state of grace. How do you live in the state of grace? Hey, the Eucharist is the ultimate Thanksgiving. Literally. Big time. Okay? And, uh, you know, think about this as Catholics. We believe that the Eucharist is truly the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And at Mass, we believe it's once and for all sacrifice and the cross is represented. So when we go to Mass, we participate in this once and for all sacrifice. But most of all, we're giving God thanks. That's what Eucharist means, thanksgiving. And that's what St. Paul called the Eucharist in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16. He says, is not the cup of thanksgiving, there it is, Eucharistia, for which we give thanks, a participation in the blood of Christ. So every time, Catholics, you go to Mass, at the center of this worship is the ultimate thanksgiving, Jesus in the Eucharist. 
And since this is the end of our liturgical calendar, here's what Bishop Sheen says. If on the last day we would receive merciful judgment, we must begin here to be merciful to others. Just as clouds release only moisture when they gather from the earth, so too can heaven release only the mercy we have sent heavenward. Have mercy on our relatives tomorrow. God bless you. For today's giveaway, call 877-526-2151. 